Thank you so much, Stephanie, and thank you to all of you for joining us. Um, it is my privilege to have this opportunity to share with you about how to access Cuyahoga DD services and supports and to explain the eligibility process. Again, my name is Amy Pender and I supervise the eligibility unit here at the County Board. My team consists of two administrative specialists who answer all of our phone calls. They accept and process the applications for eligibility that we receive. They send out correspondence and then they assign um, an eligibility support administrator to help individuals walk through the process. We do have six eligibility support administrators who are assigned to each person to help assist them throughout the process and, and really help them along the way until a determination is made. So let's just begin by talking with you about how we determine eligibility here at the, at the County Board. So residents of Cuyahoga County who have a developmental disability can apply for County Board services. First, we'll need to verify that the individual does have a documented qualifying uh, diagnosis of a developmental disability that has been made by a qualified professional, like a doctor, a psychologist, nurse practitioner. Um, a developmental disability um, is characterized by a few criteria, and I wanted to share that with you today. Um, first, it's a severe chronic disability that is caused by a, a metal, mental or physical impairment or a combination, but it is not solely a diagnosis of a mental illness or mental health disorder. It does need to manifest prior to the age of 22, so it needs to be diagnosed prior to that age. It is going to uh, likely to continue indefinitely, so it's not something that, that um, you know, they, they grow out of or they stop. It's going to continue indefinitely. And then it results in developmental delays or substantial functional limitations in major life areas. Um, we're gonna talk about those things a little bit more, but I wanted to just kind of share with you a list of the developmental disabilities that we typically see. This is just kind of a sense, to give you a sense of what is a qualifying condition, um, but it's not a comprehensive look. Um, some of the common um, conditions we encounter are intellectual disabilities, um, seizure disorder, ADHD, autism, cerebral palsy, those kinds of things. Again, there are many others, um, but this is just a few that, that we often see. So once we have that qualifying diagnosis, then we move on to assess for delays or substantial functional limitations in areas of daily living. So this is typically broken out by age group, as you see here. So for infants through um, age two, our early intervention departments, as Kelly talked about, they collaborate with Bright Beginnings and they assess for um, one developmental delay in the life of the child. They develop a therapeutic plan of care, they um, involve developmental specialists, and they, uh, Bright Beginnings also provides case management for that age group. For ages three and above, that's when our eligibility team at the Cuyahoga DD uh, becomes involved. So for ages three to five, um, our staff look at, um, they complete a record review. So they look at the documentation, such as an evaluation team report. This is a report that is completed by the school district, um, and it can provide us a lot of information about, um, you know, some of the, the delays that, that that child may have. Um, this can occur even if they're not attending preschool, they can still have an ETR completed through the school district. Um, so we are looking for evidence of two developmental delays at this age group. Things like communication, um, sensory needs, um, adaptive skills, receptive and expressive language um, delays. So those are the things we're looking at with regard to delays. Then for the um, age six to 15 age group, 
that's when we actually require a clinical diagnosis of that developmental disability. And then we complete a formal assessment. This assessment for children ages 6 to 15 is called the Children's Ohio Eligibility Determination Instrument. You may have heard or may know that this is referred to as the COEDI. Um, in that assessment, we are looking for three substantial functional limitations um, out of the six areas that we assess. Then for the 6 to 15 age group, we also require the um, clinical diagnosis of the developmental disability. And then we administer um, another formal assessment called the OETI. It's the Ohio um, Eligibility Determination Instrument. We are looking for seven areas of a person's life. And um, in order to be eligible, there would need to, again, be three substantial functional limitations in those areas. These tools are tools that were developed by the Ohio Department of Developmental Disabilities and county boards use them as a way to identify um, areas of need um, that individuals might have, areas of ability and skill. Um, and again, we're looking for deficits in three of those areas. Um, so what are we assessing to make that determination? Talk about that. So when we are completing the COETI or OETI assessment, we are looking at each of the following major life activity areas. So the mobility, the receptive expressive language, self-care, self-direction, um, learning capacity for independent living. And for those that are 16 and older, we look at economic self-sufficiency. So in each of these areas, there are multiple questions contained in, in these assessment areas. They really allow us to understand better about what a person's skills are. Um, while we're completing the assessment, we look at input from various perspectives in that individual's life. We look at how they're functioning across environments. What does it look like from one environment to another? And then we also do um, complete kind of a direct observation of some of these activities um, in the assessment itself. So I wanna just kind of point out that if a person has um, an area of deficit in maybe the area of mobility, um, that may not necessarily mean that the individual has a limitation overall in that area. Each of these areas have, like I said, multiple questions. And so there's a score process that's followed to determine if indeed there is enough to warrant a limitation in that particular area. Okay. So let's talk about the eligibility process itself and what someone can expect when they're going through the process. So I talked about the support administrators, the eligibility support administrators. They're going to be assigned to assist someone each step of the way to really help individuals and families know what to expect, what to happen next, what's needed until a determination is made. So we begin by mailing out a welcome packet to individuals and families, and we identify the documents that we are going to need to verify that qualifying diagnosis. So in addition to that, we're going to ask for a release of information to be signed, you're gonna ask for a birth certificate and social security card. And then we are going to ask for documentation to um, verify that qualifying diagnosis or condition. The documents that we're asking for need to show that the onset of the disability occurred prior to the age of 22 and that it needs to be signed by a qualified professional um, who is especially trained in that area. They, they are assess, they can assess in that area, they can diagnose, and they can treat in that area. So if it's a medical diagnosis, we're going to need a medical professional to, to have uh, verified that in that paperwork. You'll see some of the re common reports that we use to verify a qualifying diagnosis listed here. 
Again, it's not an all-inclusive list, but these are the most common. Often we find that families um, can directly access these documents um, that we need to verify a diagnosis pretty easily, but we do understand that sometimes there might be barriers. It is okay to let us know if you need help with obtaining the documentation we're asking for. That's why we're asking for a release of information so that in the event we can um, you know, support you in this way, um, we can do things like, you know, contact a doctor or send, um, you know, specifics about what is needed. The support each family needs is really tailored um, to them. Um, and so the process is different. So sometimes we're provided with all of the information we need. And then sometimes, you know, families need a little extra support to gather those documents. And we understand that. So then let's talk about the next step, which is once we've received information to review, the eligibility support administrator is going to determine if we have enough information. Or sometimes we also ask for a further review by one of our specialty areas, um, like psychology, a nurse, um, a speech and language pathologist. So we ask them those disciplines to kind of help us understand any uncommon diagnoses we run into, or they can sometimes help us piece together information from multiple sources to really establish a, a preponderance of the evidence of that diagnosis. One thing that's important to note here is that it is not uncommon for us to ask for additional information. So let's talk about why we might ask for more documentation from you. Um, so some examples um, could be that uh, maybe we receive a note from a doctor about a particular diagnosis, or we receive emergency room paperwork. Um, maybe that, you know, references a particular diagnosis but it doesn't provide the full picture of how or why the diagnosis was made. And it doesn't use what tool or test was used to make that diagnosis. So that it will not be enough. We'll need to ask for more. Um, sometimes we receive school records. Um, sometimes within those school records in that ETR that I mentioned, the evaluation team report, it references a diagnostic evaluation or assessment that was completed by another agency or a doctor. We're going to need to see that information. Um, as we review the do documentation, um, we do consider the diagnostic criteria that was used to make the diagnosis, and we have to ensure that that criteria has been met. So I'm going to give you some examples about what we're kind of looking for with regard to specific diagnoses. Um, intellectual disability. So when we have someone with an intellectual disability, we typically, that's confirmed typically by a clinical assessment and standardized testing. So there are three things kind of in that assessment that we're looking for. Um, we're looking for evidence of deficits in intellectual functioning. Um, kind of confirmed by that clinical assessment. Um, it's comprehensive um, in nature. And then we're looking for evidence of deficits in adaptive behavior functioning. So this means that the person is struggling in one or more activities of daily living across environments, like communication, um, social participation, um, you know, independent living kind of across multiple environments. And so we're looking for those levels um, and how they were assessed. So both intellectual and adaptive deficits must be present during that developmental period, which is it which is to that age 22. And since we don't have the document that will um, show us this, we do recommend then that a person complete a full-scale IQ assessment, um, and that will include the composite score of that, that IQ test, but it also will have adaptive behavior scores. Um, for the IQ testing, we, do, um, we don't accept abbreviated testing or measures of IQ, 
Um, those are typical, typically general estimates of someone's intelligence, but it is used like as a screening, but it is not typically making a definitive diagnosis of an intellectual disability. Um, for ADHD, that's another common diagnosis that we see and encounter. Um, what we're looking for is evidence that the diagnosis is current, like within the last year or two, and that the diagnostic assessment, um, there was a diagnostic assessment used. It does need to explain the symptoms of the condition, how it's impacting the person, and that the diagnosis remains a current diagnosed condition. It's also important to note that there needs to be some demonstration of evidence that the presenting concerns are not attributed to another diagnosis that the person has. Um, talk about autism. Autism is another um, condition that we, we often see. And so what we're looking for with regard to autism is again, that comprehensive evaluation completed by a licensed qualified professional prior to the age of 22. It, the assessment or evaluation should include a history of presenting problems, the date of diagnosis, the duration, and the severity of the disorder. We're gonna look at functioning levels in the areas of social communication, um, and then the current impact on that person's functioning. Um, it's in school, um, in employment, in other day, you know, at home, and other daily activities. There, again, needs to be an explanation indicating that the concerns that the individual is presenting is not better accounted for by another diagnosis, say, of um, obsessive compulsive disorder or anxiety, those kind of things. Uh, schools, they may have completed a screening for autism to support whether a child qualifies for a specific classroom or type of instruction, but we will still need a comprehensive diagnostic evaluation. And therefore, oftentimes we recommend that this be completed at one of the autism clinics in our local hospital settings. Um, we do have other resources that we can provide to, to families and individuals to obtain this documentation and, and evaluation. So the main takeaway about documentation is that people should expect that we will ask for that diagnostic assessment that was used or other collateral documents, other documents that kind of help us piece together that history. Um, we want to see the impact on functioning across environments and especially during that developmental period. We will always explain what exactly is needed, and we are willing to assist in any way to help the individual or family to, again, obtain that information if there's a barrier. So once that diagnosis, oh, sorry, once that diagnosis is verified, then the next step to complete is the assessment, is the appointment. And that's, again, for anyone ages six and over. We are going to complete either a co-edy or OEDI assessment. And we're going to run through all of those life areas that I just talked about. The support administrator, the eligibility support administrator is gonna meet with the person and those that know the person the best. They're gonna conduct that comprehensive assessment and they're gonna look at all of those, those areas through observation and gaining information from, from the person and from um, the family or, or people that know them best. Um, the person, it's important to note that the person is not going to walk away from this assessment knowing the outcome of the eligibility determination at that time. The eligibility support administrator is going to come back and score that assessment in all of those questions and come up with um, a determination about each of those areas to know if they have a limitation in that area. The support administrator, once they score that, is going to then share the determination outcome and the results of that. So that's the last step in the process. If the person is found eligible, then the eligibility essay is going to submit referrals to get the person connected with Cuyahoga DD supports. Um, if the person is found not eligible, we notify the person in writing that they're being found not eligible 
And then we offer appeal information, which includes the steps a person can take if they disagree with the outcome or determination. This is, can be done in an, in, in an informal and a formal way. It's just important that the appeal needs to come from the individual themselves and or their legal guardian. In the event that people are not found eligible for county board services, we never want to turn someone away from, you know, the reason that they first came to us in the first place. So we often, we always provide um, community resource options to try to help meet the person's needs um, that maybe brought them to us in the first place. Please know that the eligibility process may take up to 60 days or longer, depending on how much documentation is received or needed, and if it meets the criteria we have discussed. So it can be shorter than that, but sometimes it can be longer than that as well. So let's talk about Oops, sorry. Let's talk about eligibility redetermination. There are times when the Ohio Department of Developmental Disabilities requires us to complete a redetermination of someone's eligibility. This redet process has to occur at ages three, six, and 16, and anytime there's a significant change in a person's needs or abilities. We typically begin initiating this process to start about three months prior to their birthday so that we can ensure all the current services that they're receiving, if they're found eligible, can continue seamlessly. Again, we will need documentation for this part of the process. We can use current documentation that we have, but we will also need a new signed release of information if there is a current ETR, the evaluation team report, which is done typically every three years, so we will need to see kind of the impacts and how that, that child is, is functioning today. And we will need to look at any current medical documents or um, clinical, clinical evaluations with new diagnoses on. So when a person is found eligible, it, we can provide the following support in collaboration with supports that are available, available through other community resources. So let's talk about a few of those available supports to people. One of the most common supports that we um, refer people to are the, is the Family Supports Program. The program is available to eligible individuals who reside in their family home with a relative, um, available for modifications, um, specialized equipment, recreational activities, those kinds of things. Another area that we often refer people to is our support administration area. Support administrators may be assigned to further discover what a person needs and then develop a plan together to help meet those needs. We have lots of different types of support administrators here at the county board. We have specialized essays who assist with maybe one-time needs. We're just hooking someone up with a particular resource. Um, we have employment support administrators who link people with jobs in the community. Um, we have housing support administrators who help individuals that maybe are in crisis find immediate housing. Um, or have ur urgent needs around housing. And then we have support administrators who assist more on a long-term basis for ongoing planning needs. They do assessments. So they kind of assess for the needs that the person has. They write a plan to help meet those needs. They help them look for providers of services. They authorize services and access appropriate funding sources. The support administrator can also assist with making referrals to needed ancillary services. So you're going to see here a list of what those kinds of ancillary services typically are. So behavior and curricular intervention services or nursing or assist, excuse me, assistive technology, home modifications. So some examples might be if someone is um, requesting occupational or physical therapy. Um, the 
court administrator can make a referral to that particular area. And then those are for services, um, for example, those are based on um, a consultative basis versus direct treatment. Um, they can be provided in multiple settings like home, community, day program, and they can address areas of activities of daily living, um, whether, you know, maybe it's home mods or sensory things. Um, and those are some of the kind of supports that they can assist with. I mentioned behavior and curricular intervention services. We call this BCIS. They uh, assist a child in both their school and home setting to identify strategies that will help the child be successful across environments. They provide information about general learning, curriculum su curricular support, maybe behavioral interventions, um, and kind of collaborating with families and staff and other professionals to kind of help meet some of those behavioral needs. So how to contact us for a referral or to make an application. So as discussed, we have for birth through two, that goes through our early intervention services. So the number is listed here and this number will be available to you afterwards in the presentation. Bright Beginnings then will contact you to assess needs for services. Again, that one delay area, they're gonna kind of get that process started with you by calling that number. So for then individuals that are ages three and up, that's when you will submit an application for county board services. And this can be done in a couple of ways. First of all, we do have an eligibility line that's listed here. So we take calls on that line. Um, but one of the more exciting and efficient ways to complete an application for eligibility is to complete that through our website. And you can access the uh, application electronically it's available in English and Spanish. Um, and one nice feature about this application process on the website is that you can attach documents right through this application. That birth certificate, that social security card, that ETR, medical documentation. And so we can receive it right through that, that portal. We will then file all of the documentation into our system. And then we're going to reach out to the individual or family and get that process started. If someone is submitting an application on someone's behalf, so a third party referral, we do take those. Um, so maybe if you're a friend or you're a school or you're another community agency, a hospital, we can accept a third party re referral on someone's behalf. What I'm going to, I'm going to give you some helpful tips, tips about that, though. If you are submitting a third party referral, please let the family know that you are making the referral and that we will be calling them with consent to proceed with that application and get the eligibility process started with consent and involved. If you're a third party referent and you have questions to ask where they are in the process and offer some support, you know, to help them get through the process, but we won't be able to share in specific information with you about the status or outcome without a release of information. So I just want to take this time to thank you for your time. And um, we want to um, answer any general questions that you might have about the eligibility process. If you do have specific questions about a specific situation or a scenario, please feel free to jot down our information and give us a call so that we can discuss this further with you. Um, and joining us now um, is Allison Gar, who is the um, SA manager with eligibility. And, and our contact information is here and it will be available in the chat as well. So if you need to reach us, here's how you can do that. And at this point, I will turn it back over to Stephanie. All right.
right, great. So we are going to open it up for questions. And thank you very much, Amy, for that uh, very informative presentation. So if you do have a question, feel free to enter your questions into chat and we will mo monitor that and ask the questions that way. 